if you're returning, inshallah, today to our second and final webinar with Amalgrib Institute and Ustad Yasb Mujahid uh, for Transformed Online, her limited edition online class that is closing, inshallah, tonight. Uh, so definitely less than 24 hours, depending on when we're watching this. It could also be already closed if you're watching in the recording. Um, I see that... That's a promising sound that you guys are now able to hear and see us. So if you are, please say your salams in the chat. Let us know where you're coming in from. And if you had joined us yesterday as well for our session on overcoming and managing stress. Um, I see the number of people are, that are joining is increasing. So welcome, welcome, welcome to all of you who are coming in either for the first time or returning. Um, and welcome back. I see some familiar names as well. Masha'Allah. Uh, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah haseeb. Where are you coming in from? Uh, Subi coming in from California, mashallah. So it's around noon for you. Um, Shafiq, wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Dilkar, where are you coming in from? Mashallah, interesting name. Uh, Rahima from Utah. Beautiful. Um, anyone coming in? I see Bush for coming in from Belgium, mashallah. Please forgive me if I butcher anybody's name. That is not my intention. Um, welcome. It's nice to see you guys. My name is Sister Hafsa from Al Maghrib Institute. Uh, inshallah, I'm going to see those of you who've already registered for Transformed Online in your student portal as we go through the experience of taking the course on principles of spiritual development with Usali Yasmin together. Um, Shafiq from India, good to hear. I think that's very late in the day for you. The topic today, for those who can't see in the title or the description, and the topic today is detox, how to break unhealthy patterns and take back control. A lot of the course transform that Usada teaches is really about uh, reinvigorating you and giving you the skills and the techniques to manage your life and manage uh, the, the, the things that are maybe not as healthy, especially in your kind of personal relationships and your relationship with yourself and your relationship with Allah and those around you. And Alhamdulillah, I can't wait for us to talk about detox today, inshallah, and how to break those unhealthy patterns in your lives. Somalia in the house. I saw some people from Somalia were registered for the class, so I'm looking forward to seeing you, Khadr, inshallah, in the class as well. Jahid coming in from Bangladesh, Libya as well, mashallah. Who else do I see? Italy, Mauritania. Um, do we have Mauritius in the house? I'm curious. I always mix up Mauritius and Mauritania, so it'll be nice to have both of you here. Bashira coming in from Ghana, um, uh, Ethiopia as well, Pakistan, Jordan, UK, Morocco, Bosnia, Herzegovina. It's amazing. Oh, mashallah, Lamia, I know where you are. Uh, Nafisa coming in from London. So nice to see the entire kind of global community uh, in support of Usada Yasmin and Al Maghrib students as well. Alhamdulillah, joining us for today's webinar. This is going to be the final webinar that we have uh, with Usada Yasmin for a minute. So take advantage of the next 30 plus minutes, inshallah, that she is with us. And of course, if you're benefiting from this content, if you love the way that she teaches, if you love the content uh, and the topics that we're covering today, please make sure that you register in the link that you see on screen, amagrib.online forward slash transformed. There's a QR code as well. If you're watching on your laptop, you want to be lazy, you can pull it up on your phone. Um, and of course, it's in the description of every video and in your chats as well. South Africa, we see you. Now, I don't want to take any more time. I want to benefit like we did yesterday, alhamdulillah, with Ustada uh, in the house. So I see that she's with us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ustada Yasmin, how are you doing today? Oh, you just frozen on us. Real quick, I think we'll have you back in just a second. I know we had a little bit of that happen uh, just in a, a couple minutes ago when we were doing a test. And I think I see you. Bismillah. There we are. Take two. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, Nisada? Wa alaikum assalam. I'm doing well. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, alhamdulillah. Yes, yeah. we can. Now. Okay, alhamdulillah. So I don't I'm wanna... doing well, alhamdulillah. Okay, I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear that. I don't want to take by the way, I just just a side point. Usada shared the picture of the fallen tree uh with us yesterday in the chat. And I was like, I was scared for you, subhanAllah. That tree was like, I think that the this the base of the tree was the size of several humans, just from the way that it looked like in the picture, mashallah. So I'm just very grateful, alhamdulillah, that you and your family are safe. Uh and that, that timing, subhanAllah, that you were away from from that kind of traumatic experience. But uh alhamdulillah, today we are covering detox, how to break unhealthy patterns and take back control. So Sada, I'm very excited for this topic. I'm sure everyone in the chat is as well. So uh, just as we're starting off, everyone who's with us, please make sure like yesterday, you share everything that uh, you share this link in your chats, your WhatsApps, your telegrams, your whatever social media that you use so others can benefit as well. And you can get some free ajr. And Usada, I'm going to pass it to you to start us off. Bismillah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassirli amri. Wa ahlul uqtata min lisani yaqqahun qawli. 
So today our topic is one that I think everyone can relate to. Um, this is about how we can start to sort of break a lot of our unhealthy patterns. Uh, in order to talk about this, this particular topic, we need to understand uh, a different type of concept. So in the psychological literature, we hear a lot about uh, different types of attachment styles. So we're taught in, you know, in a lot of this literature that uh, as children, for example, we develop attachments to our parents and there are different types of attachments. So generally, psychologists talk about uh, something called a secure attachment. And then there are various types of insecure attachments. So they talk about a secure attachment is when a child has a healthy bond with the caretaker and that this secure attachment ends up becoming sort of the um, the foundation for all future relationships being more healthy for that individual. And then there are different types of insecure attachments. Um, there are the avoidant type of attachment or the anxious attached. And basically what this is talking about is the anxious attachment style is a type of person who sort of in, in colli colloquial sort of lingo, we would call them very needy. These are individuals who are very uh, sort of have a fear of abandonment. They have a fear of, um, of, of basically being hurt or if people leaving them. Uh, and so they, they would call this type of attachment style an anxious attachment uh, style or an anxiously anxious attachment. Uh, anxious attached and then you have uh, another type of attachment style that psychologists talk about which is the uh, the avoidant attachment style avoidant are individuals who uh, really really value their independence to the extent that they uh, they don't uh, sometimes they they might actually put up a lot of guards and aren't that comfortable with vulnerability or intimacy uh, and intimacy here not just talking about physical intimacy but also talking about emotional intimacy. So these are individuals who uh, the way in which they would deal with stress would be more to shut down, to more to pull away. Uh, and so psychologists talk about how some of these dynamics end up playing out in relationships. So oftentimes, for whatever reason, um, people who have an anxious attachment style tend to end up with people with an avoidant attachment style. And it kind of creates this sort of very um, difficult dynamic where one person is sort of chasing the other, the other person is, is pulling away. And what that does is it, unfortunately, it can, it can actually add to the, the fears that these both these individuals have, because for a person with anxious attachment, they're, they're afraid of being, le uh, of being left, right? They're afraid of abandonment. Whereas people with avoidant attachment, I think, unless it's just from my end, we may have lost Usada just for a second. So she's going to reconnect with us uh, just now. <laughs> and I see you back with us, Usada. Welcome back. Oh, good. Okay, good. How long did you lose me? Uh, like literally seven seconds. So Okay. Oh, All right. So, so, so basically speaking about, um, so the biggest fear for a person with an anxious attachment style is abandonment, right? But the biggest fear for a person with an anxious attachment style is engulfment or losing their independence, uh, the feeling of being controlled by another person. And so um, what happens is that sometimes this dynamic can kind of bring out more of the, those fears in each type of individual. Now, when we talk about attachments in a spiritual sort of context, uh, like for example, the way that I speak about attachments in, in, in my book, Reclaim Your Heart, um, and in my new book, Healing the Emptiness, and in the class, Transform. So I talk about attachments uh, in, in, in a little bit of, of a different way. So the um, definition here is important. When I talk about attachments, uh, what I am referring to is not this type of, you know, for example, secure attachment uh, to, to a parent or a secure attachment within a relationship, but rather I am talking about different types of insecure or uh, another way to understand is unhealthy attachments. And in a spiritual sort of perspective uh, or context, that is referring to unhealthy attachments, uh, unhealthy um, attachments in the spiritual realm. So this is what happens when we 
um, become dependent on the creation in the way that we should become dependent on the creator. So this is a little bit different discussion uh, in terms of the, dis you know, in the, in the context of attachments. Um, why is this so important? The reason this is so important is there is a very fundamental human principle. There is a very fundamental principle in, in life. And that is whatever you put at your center becomes your master. So how that plays out is if you look at the human heart, now talking about the spiritual heart, the qalb, when you look at the human heart, we, um, if you look at the very core of the spiritual heart, that is the place where a person would put what matters most to them. Uh, this is essentially the place where we put an ilah. Now, an ilah is something that we don't just pray to, we don't just um, adore, but an ilah is essentially our center of our lives and our center of our hearts. So everyone has some sort of an ilah. Everyone has a center in their life. Everyone has um, an idol, so to say, uh, in, in, in a sense, where uh, even a person who doesn't believe in God still has a center in their life. So even a person who is an atheist, even a person who is an agnostic, uh, still has something that they worship. And when I say worship, I don't mean that they are praying to this thing. I mean that they are putting this thing at their center, at their core. So for some people, their center is, um, it can be money, it can be power, it can be status. Recently, I think, um, you know, uh, there are certain things that in our culture today, we've taken as our center, and it isn't God. It isn't a God-centered existence that we're living in right now. It isn't a God-centered culture. It isn't a God-centered life that the vast majority of humans on this earth are living right now. So what are some of the things that people are putting at their center? Well, I mentioned a few. Money is a big one, you know, um, where a person, he doesn't, he or she doesn't need to make a statue out of money to worship money, but rather to live your life in such a way that money becomes your focal point, that money becomes the most important thing to you. That is a type of worship. So you're putting money at your center, the center of your life and the center of your heart. That is a type of worship that becomes a type of ilah. You know, when we when we say, you know, that the core or the foundation of our deen is la ilaha illallah, that there is nothing worthy of being an ilah except for God. So in other words, there's nothing worthy of being at my center. We've just lost her. Just give it one second, inshallah, and she'll be right back with us. Jazakallah, everyone, for your patience, and hopefully uh, you're benefiting so far from the gems that Usada has shared thus far in the session. Um, if you want to hear a lot more, uh, Alhamdulillah, Transformed Online has been professionally recorded and edited, so there's no Wi-Fi or internet uh, connection to worry about. It is a complete online uh, course and seminar that speaks about everything that Usada is discussing in far more depth and covers a myriad of topics. If you're interested to know more, please head over to amalgrib.online forward slash transformed. And uh, inshallah, there's a lot more details for you there. And I see Usada is back with us, Bismillah. And so when I declare la ilaha illallah, I am declaring that nothing else has that right over me to be my center, to be my ilah. Not money, not status, not my career, not power. And so when we look at the sort of our modern day life, what are some of the things that many of us have started to put at our center? What are some of the unhealthy attachments that we have in our life? Well, as a society, I think there are certain things that, that we're almost encouraged to worship. One of them, one of the top uh, of the list now in the current society that we live in, especially in Western society, is something called hawa. What is hawa? Hawa in the Quran is basically defined as one's own desires, one's own inclination, one's own orientation, one's own opinions. 
This is all of these things fall under the umbrella term hawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us in the Quran about worshiping our hawa. Because when a person worships their own lower desire or their own, you know, we have our own opinions. We have our own inclinations as human beings. We have our own directions that, that our nafs might lead us to. Every human being has desires. Every human being has inclinations and orientations. And, and these change over time. But if we worship these things, if these things become our ultimate guiding force, that is when we become destroyed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against doing that. He says in the Quran, do you see the one who takes his hawa as his ilah? This is in Surah Al-Jathiyah. Do you see the one who takes his hawa, his desires, his inclinations, his orientations, his opinions as his God? That is individual becomes blinded that individual becomes lost so allah warns us against taking our hawa as our ilah another sort of common um ilah that we see in our societies today is the ilah of fame fame and power so especially in you know i'd say current the the the, the, the um the new generations one of the most important things has become become famous, right? And so there's this big push to do whatever it takes to become famous. And people do crazy things. They'll do anything to just get followers, to just get likes, to get people to see them, to, to get people to know them. And so this push for fame has almost become an idol. These are all different types of unhealthy attachments. Because at the end of the day, we were created with a heart that was only made to worship God. It was not made to worship money. It was not made to worship status. It was not made to worship our own desires. And it was not made to worship fame. And if we worship any of these other things, we actually break our own hearts. This is the reason why, ultimately, at a very, very deep level, human beings suffer. So suffering is something that is, is, is almost optional. We decide whether or not we will continue to contribute to our own suffering. Now, um, hardships definitely will occur in our life. Pain is inevitable in this life. But suffering doesn't have to be. And sometimes our own suffering is actually caused by our unhealthy attachments. So if a person takes money or if a person takes their own desires, if a person takes the pursuit of fame and, um, and, and status as their focal point in life, as what they're living for, as what their drive their, 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 their most intense driving force. If someone lives that way, that person will actually cause their own suffering. So one analogy I use in the course is like taking your car to the gas station, right? And while you're at the gas station, you realize, you know, gas is really expensive. Um, I don't want to put gas in the car. Instead, I'm going to put orange juice. So you decide, okay, I'm going to save some money. I'm going to put orange juice in my car instead of gasoline or petrol, whatever it's called in your particular region. And now what have you done to the car? Well, you may have saved money, but you've just broken your car. And the reason for that is that the manufacturer of the car created it in such a way that only one type of thing goes in that gas tank. And if you put anything else in that gas tank, you break the car. This is what happens to the human heart. So the human heart, think of it as this tank, right? And it's a tank that is created by Allah. And that tank is created by Allah to only be able to handle one thing at its core. So in other words, our hearts were created to only be able to handle Tawheed, La ilaha illallah. Our hearts, the core of our heart, is only designed to be able to take God as its center, God as its ilah. And if we take something other than God, 
and start to worship it or love it or fear it as we should only worship, love, or fear God, it actually breaks us. It breaks the heart and it breaks the soul and the spirit of that individual. And it causes unbelievable, unbelievable amounts of suffering. So essentially, the, the root cause of suffering is taking something other than God and loving it as we should only love God or attaching to it as we should only attach to God or, or obeying it as we should only obey God. So when we obey our desires, as we should only obey God, we suffer and the society suffers because our desires can be all over the place. A person can have a violent inclination. Does that mean that they should obey that violent inclination? A person can have any sort of inclination, may want something that doesn't belong to them or may want something in a way that is immoral. So do we obey these desires? And if we do, not only do we hurt and destroy ourselves, but we hurt and we destroy society. So ultimately, destruction and suffering at an individual level and a societal level comes essentially from putting anything other than God at the center of our lives or at the center of our hearts. It's orange juice in the gas tank. And so what I teach in this course in Transformed is I teach people Practically, I actually go through step by step teaching people how to ascertain what their unhealthy attachments are because everyone is different. You know, one person might have a certain type of attachment to money. Another person might have a certain type of attachment to what other people think. Some other person might have an attachment to status or to power or to fame. And there's another type of attachment that many of us have that can be very unhealthy and no one tells us this, all right? And one of them is our attachment to our own children. This is one that a lot of people suffer from, and yet nobody understands, many people don't understand why they're suffering. So we can actually become attached to our own child in a way that is extremely unhealthy. Similarly, we can become attached to our own spouse, to our own parents, to our own sibling, to any human being in a way that is unhealthy, even when that human being is halal for us to love, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah At-Tawbah, for example, and this is one of those, um, one of the, the modules where I, that I teach in this course is looking at this very profound ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lists all of these things that are perfectly halal, right? So he lists, uh, uh, you know, eight different things that are perfectly halal. Allah begins by saying, say, if your parents, your fathers, fathers meaning your parents, or your children, or your spouses, or your siblings, or your relatives, or your business where you fear decline, or your dwelling, your home, if any of these things, this is where Allah warns us. Now, keep in mind, Allah has just listed all halal things, right? Is it haram to love your spouse? Is it haram to love your parents, your children, your, your, your siblings, your business, your home? But here's where he warns us. He says, if any one of those things, he says, أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ so Allah says that if any of these halal things are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and striving in his cause, فَتَرَبَّسُ So then, then wait. <laughs> so Allah here, فَتَرَبَّسُ means to wait. And then he says to wait until Allah brings about his decision. Now, when you think about what Allah is telling us in this ayah, and then Allah ends the ayah by saying he does not guide the defiantly disobedient. So what do we learn from this ayah? Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not threatening, but Allah is warning that if anyone takes any of these things, which are all halal to love, and loves them more than Allah, or even as they should love Allah and his messenger and striving in his cause, 
then that individual will suffer, not because Allah is making them suffer. See, when we go back to the analogy, let's go back to the car that you put orange juice in, right? Whose fault is it when you destroy that car? Can you go and say, you know what? It's Mercedes' fault. It's, it's Toyota's fault, right? The car isn't working. Whose fault is it that the car is broken now? You can't go and sue man the manufacturer. You can't go and say, it's your fault, Toyota. My car is not working. It's broken. It's entirely the user's fault because they did something to the car that the car wasn't able to handle. This is what happens when you take any other thing, whether that's your own child, whether that's your money, halal money, halal business, halal home, um, you know, your, your spouse, totally halal for you, your parents, of course it's halal to love them. But if you take any of these things and you put them in the wrong place in your heart, then you suffer. And this is really, you know, so sometimes we hear this concept and we're, and we're like, no, I love Allah most, right? But what we don't realize is that sometimes we are suffering because we don't recognize that we have put something else at our center. And now sometimes the hardest thing is first figuring out what that is. And this is what I do in the course is I take people step by step and, and there, there's actually exercises where I take them step by step to, act, to start to introspect and to ascertain what are my unhealthy attachments? What have I done? Uh, where have I put things out of place in my own heart? And then, of course, the second step is how do I remove it? And we discuss that as well. Um, we talk about how can we start to have healthier attachments to the things that we love, right? Because Islam doesn't tell you not to love your children. Islam doesn't tell you not to love your spouse. Islam doesn't tell you you can't have a career or not to love your parents. Of course not. But Islam teaches us how to love in a healthy way. And when we love in a healthy way, then that relationship becomes so much stronger and so much better for both parties. So when I, I just want to, inshallah, just give you an example of this. And then, inshallah, I want to have time for Q&A. So one example of this that I see so prevalent, especially in many cultures, is to... Um, to love our children in an unhealthy way. So a lot of times, especially mothers are taught that the moment that they have a child, especially when it's a son, that that child, that son is meant to become your center. And now you should um, sort of neglect yourself, even neglect your marriage sometimes, neglect your, your, your personal development, even your, your Islamic development, um, Anything that has to do with anything outside of the child is meant to be neglected for the sake of the child. Now, that may sound really loving. That may sound really sacrificial, but it is, in fact, unhealthy. And when you do that, it actually, um, it, number one, most important, it takes away from the place that Allah is supposed to have. Because no human being is supposed to be your center. Only Allah is supposed to be your center. So your child, your son, is not supposed to be your qibla, right? It's not supposed to be your um, sort of your 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 kaaba that you do tawaf around. Right? I, I've seen this over and over and over where you'll have this dynamic where especially the son sort of becomes the mother's center and she just does tawaf around him his entire life. And of course, what happens is that as he grows up and now when he's ready to have his own family and to get married, a lot of times the mother isn't able to let go. And so it becomes another, it's sort of an unhealthy dynamic from the beginning. It gets transferred to a different type of unhealthy dynamic where now you sometimes see this competitiveness between the mother-in-law and the wife. And there isn't supposed to be that type of competitiveness because they're in entirely different categories. Why would there be a competitiveness? I mean, I, it's one thing if you're talking about two people in the same category, right? But you're talking about two entirely different categories, the mother and the wife. And the fact that there becomes a competition between them means that there's something unhealthy at the root, something unhealthy in the attachment. And a lot of times that's because this son was at the center in a way that was very unhealthy, that Allah should have been. 
Allah should have been your center, not your son, not your child. And, and, and you aren't supposed to sacrifice everything and lose balance uh, as soon as you become a mother. So really it's about, and, and what Transformed is about, is about how, how to practically live our lives in an Islamic spiritual way that balances all of these things, that we learn to love our, our families, our, our parents, our spouse, our children, even our careers, even our money, even our homes, our business, everything, but in a healthy way, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has his rightful place in our hearts and in our lives. And only then can everything else take its rightful place. And only then can you actually do justice to all of the other parts of your life. The thing that you will find when you have, a un when you have an unhealthy attachment to one thing, is that by definition, listen carefully, by definition, you will do injustice to other things. So if you have, for example, an unhealthy attachment to your career, you will by definition do injustice to your family. If you have an unhealthy attachment to your son, you will by definition do injustice to his wife when he grows up or to your own husband when you are not giving your husband his right because for example, the mother is sleeping next to the child while the husband sleeps alone in another room. So you see that any time there is an unhealthy attachment, you will by definition do injustice to your other responsibilities. And we know in Islam that um, it is a deen that teaches justice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to be just. And Allah tells us that we have responsibilities. And we don't just have one, but we have responsibilities and 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 um, rights uh, upon upon us and upon others, right? We have a responsibility to ourselves, to our bodies. You know, if you have an unhealthy attachment to maybe uh, making money, you might end up taking away the rights of your body, the rights of your own health, the the rights of yourself upon you because you're working. Uh, you know, you're a workaholic, and 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 so you're actually depriving or being unjust to yourself because of this unhealthy attachment to making money uh, or having an unhealthy attachment to status. And because you're, you're, you're chasing that or having an unhealthy attachment to what people think will make you do injustice. For example, when you have a child, when you have a daughter who's being abused and she comes to you and tells you that she's being abused and you tell her to go back to her abusive husband because you don't want society to say she's divorced. So you're more concerned about what people think than the safety of your own daughter. And this comes from an unhealthy attachment. So any unhealthy attachment will by definition cause suffering to yourself, to others and to the society, and it will always make you unjust. And so really the only way to try to strive towards balance and strive towards justice is to only have Allah at the center and not have any other thing competing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our hearts or in our lives. أَقُولِ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ وَلَكُمْ إِنَّا غَفُونُ الرَّحِيمُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُ بِحَمْدَكَ أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنْتْ أَسْتَغْفِرُكُ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْكَ Jazakallah khair, Sada, subhanAllah. I feel like no matter how many times I take the course, you realize uh, after after a period of time, you start to get complacent again. Mm -hmm. And then you think now that you, you hit every single category, you know, job, friends, family, every relationship, and all that kind of stuff, you start to realize, subhanAllah, there's something I've been letting slip and there's an unhealthy attack that I have to tackle. But Jazakallah khair for being so, you know, like thorough, mashallah, in your examples. And what I really appreciate about this course, I think I mentioned this previously as well, is that it really helps to have, it seems like oversimplification, like the orange juice and the gas tank and that the waff around the child, but it really helps you to encapsulate exactly what the issue is and exactly how weird or strange it is that you're putting this thing in the center of your heart. It's just as strange as if you were to do this, uh, you know, equally strange act. So subhanAllah. Uh, I really appreciate that way you, that you the way that you dumb it down and also you know make it a lot more relatable for us as an audience. Uh, for those who are joining us, just a reminder that Transformed is actually closing tonight, so the urgency is 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 past due. Especially if you're watching this in the recording, it may already have been closed. So make sure that you take the opportunity while you're listening to go over to amagrib.online forward slash transformed and uh, make sure that you register. If you have any questions, you have some answers there on the page, and there's an amazing team ready to support you as well uh, with with your registration, but make sure you don't lose this opportunity because it doesn't come by often.
Um, Usada, I know we have some limited time available, inshallah, for questions. I know we won't be able to tackle all of them, but we'll take a few, inshallah, from those that have been submitted uh, in the chat. Those of you who are listening, please feel free to drop them in the chat uh, wherever you're listening from Facebook or YouTube, and we'll try to take a few before we close off today, inshallah. The first question that I have is, how can I assess that Allah is my pain and I don't have any uh, any healthy unhealthy attachments. So just to repeat that, how can I assess that Allah is my pain and I don't have any unhealthy attachments? So I'm assuming that the question is basically asking, um, how do I know if Allah is at my center or something else, right? And, and generally that's what the question is. And a lot of people have this question. That's why I actually go through these steps in the course. So um, I, I take students through the practical process of looking at their own lives and asking themselves some very difficult questions that a lot of us actually, you know, the interesting thing is some of these questions are, um, they're obvious, but we don't understand why these things happen. And so what I do is I, I, I try to make people look at their own lives and ask these questions to themselves that end up bringing them to what it is that they could be putting what what's their orange juice essentially that they're putting in their gas tank so i'll just give you one of the questions that that i share and i have several questions that i go through um in the modules in the course but one of them is what makes me cry most what makes me cry most and you know if you look at your life what causes me the most pain essentially if you look at your life and this this answers your question as well how do I know that um, Allah's at my center and not something else? Well, the answer is that how does the car know that orange juice is inside the tank or gasoline? And the answer is the car knows, right? The car feels it. The car is going to know. Um, it's going to cause a lot of pain to the car. If the car had a voice at, at that point, when you poured the orange juice in it, it would scream. Right? It would be like, what did you just do to me? Right? It's like, a person who drinks gasoline, for example. Now, now let's flip flip the analogy, okay? So the car needs gasoline and not orange juice. Human beings can drink orange juice but not gasoline, right? Now, how do we? What happens if we were to flip it? What What would happen if a human being accidentally drank orange juice in? Or sorry, accidentally drank gasoline instead of orange juice? How would we know? What's the answer? you're going to know, you're going to know because you're going to be in excruciating pain, you're going to feel it. And that's what happens with our attachments, your heart lets you know, because you've just taken something and put it inside of you that wasn't meant to be there. The same way that if you were to drink gasoline, you would know, you would feel it immediately. And so this is what happens with our unhealthy attachments, you'll know that you have an unhealthy attachment, because you will be suffering, you will feel Ex extreme amounts of, of, of pain, you will feel extreme amounts of anxiety, you will feel extreme amounts of torment, it will actually, your heart will let you know that you put something in there that isn't meant to be there. Just like if you drank gasoline instead of orange juice. Beautiful, that's a great explanation. Actually, <laughs> so I think a lot of people are know that they're suffering, they know something's off, but they don't know why they're suffering. And I think what's mm -hmm. nice about this course is that we kind of unpack uh, especially I like the focus on the heart and understanding the, the, the motivations of the heart, what makes it take, what, you know, you know, subhanAllah, there's a whole module on the introduction to the heart. And then we go into hardships and pain. And then we go into relationships because it's a, it's something that you have to build upon. So it's, you have to understand yourself before you can heal yourself. And I think that's very crucial in this class. Um, um, the next question that we have that's been submitted is how do I stop feeling guilty about my children not taking Islam seriously? Well, um, SubhanAllah, children are a test and children are a blessing and children are a gift and children are an amana. Children are all of these things put together. Um, however, one thing you have to remind yourself is just like Muhammad Sallallahu he was told, la tahdi man ahbabt, yahdi man yasha. He was told that indeed you do not guide whom you love, but indeed Allah guides whom he wills. And so if Muhammad Sallallahu could not have the power to guide his own uncle, then what about us, right? He was the best of creation and he could not guide his own uncle who he loved and he tried so hard to bring him to Islam. So on the one hand, we have to recognize that we don't do the guiding. We cannot guide another person. 
we can only do our part, which is what Muhammad Sallallahu did and what all the prophets do, is they did their part, right? They, they called to Allah in the best way, but the guidance comes from God. Look at Nuh alayhi salam. His own son did not believe. Look at Lut alayhi salam. His own wife did not believe. So sometimes we are told, you know, shown in, in, the, in these stories, like Ibrahim alayhi salam, his own father did not believe. Muhammad alayhi salam, his own uncle did not believe, right? So what we're taught by this is that, is that we are, we cannot guide and we are also not held responsible for another person's guidance. That's another point. Because if I don't have the power to guide another person, how is Allah going to hold me accountable for that? What are we held accountable for as parents, for example? So Muhammad Sallallahu he was held accountable for giving the message. All the prophets were held accountable for giving the message, but they were not held accountable for how many people and who uh, believed in that message or who accepted that, that guidance. Similarly, as parents, we are held accountable for doing our part to, to hand that guidance, to teach our children, to, um, to, to bring uh, the message of Islam to the best of our ability to our children. So we, we sort of have that role of, of, of prophets uh, to bring the message, to teach our children, but we are not responsible for what they do with it, right? We can only do our part. And I advise you uh, and myself, and I remind you and myself, keep making dua to the one who can guide, right? He is al-hadi, Allah is al-hadi. So keep, don't lose hope either. Do your part, don't beat yourself up, but don't lose hope either. And continue to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to al-hadi, to guide your children, to guide you and your family, and to keep you on the straight path. Because istiqama is one of the hardest things, to, to be firm and steadfast on the straight path. One of the du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu that he would repeat uh, regularly is, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O turner of hearts. O turner of that which turns, right? Qalb is something that is that keeps turning. That The meaning of the word uh, itself means that which turns. So the qalb itself, its nature is that it turns, and it turns often, and it turns easily. So we ask Allah, and, and this is something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Allah, Ya muqallib al-qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O turner of hearts, O turner of that which turns. Keep my heart firm on your deen. So we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that and ask for that for our children and, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guidance. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. Every single day, at least 17 times, we call out to Allah, you alone do we worship and you alone do we seek help from. Beautifully explained as well. Then, um, just a reminder: we're going to try to take a few more questions. But for those who don't we, uh, get their questions answered today, sincere apologies from our end. We're limited in time. But just a reminder that in the class transform, there are dedicated Q and A sessions with Usada. We've just scheduled the first couple of sessions, uh, Alhamdulillah, for October twenty sixth and November thirtieth as well, so that you guys can prepare for them. You can start submitting your questions ahead of time. You can think about them as you're going through the course content, uh, and make sure that you get your thorough answers as well from Usada. So that, that's just a reminder that. You you will have plenty of opportunity to get those asked and answered in dedicated sessions that are just focused on Q&As. And to be honest, I benefit almost more sometimes from the Q&As than even the class content. Because of how some of the things that people are struggling through, you never, you can't even imagine how you navigate that until they ask it and they saw that you give us your guidance in terms of how to reframe and how to actually tackle some of the most difficult experiences that we can have as human beings. Yeah, I think, um, I so think the, the Q&A actually, I, I, I personally love the Q&As as well. Because what it is, is that it's about how people are taking the content from the class and then applying it. Because this yeah. is, and this is one of the biggest things that I really, really try to focus on is not just giving concepts that are just theoretical, but how do we live these concepts? How does this concept play out in my actual life? You know, in my, in my life as a doctor, as a teacher, as a mother, as a wife, as a husband, you know, that, that we're actually living these things. So I, I, I also appreciate when people take the course, they, they interact with the material and then, and then they come back with questions and then we can really delve into like making it very practical. 
Yeah, I love that. And also that the questions are anonymous in that context. Nobody else gets to see who, what, where, when, why. We have to kind of guess, is this a female? Is this a brother speaking, a sister speaking? Mm -hmm. uh, make sure we're answering the right person because this allows people to be a little bit more open as well and not to worry about their own. Like on social media right now, people have their Facebook and their YouTube profiles linked to this. In the course, it's all going to be a private experience. So that's beneficial as well. Not to mention that you have a private community who's going through the same experience, listening to the same content, uh, you know, present in the same spaces alhamdulillah and able to support each other and that's my favorite thing uh, alhamdulillah about the course as well uh, another question that's been submitted is is negative thinking and overthinking from the shaitan well very very good question um we know that definitely there are different sources of thoughts right so we are told that obviously shaitan he does whisper uh shaitan and his army whisper to us we ask for protection in the quran one of the uh, surahs in the quran uh, Surah An-Nas is asking specifically for protection from the waswas uh, of of shaitan, right? So, that oh, that we're asking for protection from the one who whispers in the chests of mankind, right? And he is, um, you know he is the one who will whisper and then he'll retreat. So the way Shaitan works is that he'll plant the seed and then he'll run away. That's his nature. And it's important to also note that this comes in the form of jinn and humans. So humans also do this, where you'll have a person who is really um, whispering in a sense to you to do something that is displeasing to Allah or something harmful, whatever it is, but they'll just sort of like, uh, they'll just sort of um, whisper it in the sense of they'll just suggest, right? Oh, you know, just a suggestion. But then they make you think as if it was your idea, right? So al waswas al khanas that the, the mo of shaitan, his 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 mode of operating is to plant the seed and run away, and or to just plant the waswasa to put it in our in our chest. Um, human beings do the same thing. Put the idea, put the suggestion in there. The media does this, right? Um, you just you just plant the, the suggestion and then you let the person think it was their idea. So definitely Shaitan can um, does whisper and can um, magnify our own uh, whispering of our own nefs as well. And that, you know, that's the second source, of course, of waswasa that Allah tells us in the Quran that there's waswasa that comes from um, from Shaitan and waswas al khanas right? The one who whispers and then retreats from, from jinn and human beings. And then he also tells us uh, that there is the that, that the nafs also whispers to us. And Allah tells us this in the Quran as well, that he knows that indeed we created mankind and we know what his own nafs whispers to him. And we are closer to him than his own jugular vein, Allah says. And this, 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 um, this ayah is telling us that our nafs also whispers to us. So our own self, our own lower self can whisper and shaitan can also whisper. So to answer your question, yes, um, the overthinking can definitely, the negative thinking can definitely be planted by shaitan and his army. It can be planted by human beings and it can be planted by our own nafs. So it can come from all these different sources. How do we protect ourselves from that? Um, again, that's an entire subject in the course. I talk about how we can have these sort of practical strategies that help us to navigate these problems, um, including mental health issues, including overthinking uh, and, and, and other, and how that plays out in our relationships. I talk about this a lot actually in my new book, Healing the Emptiness as well, and how, um, the the negative thinking patterns that we have so an entire section about negative thinking patterns that sometimes it is a um, it is as a re, as a result of weswasa and sometimes it is a result of our own nafs and sometimes it can be a mental health issue as well so there are there's a whole spectrum right we know that for example within within uh, mental health issues there can be something called obsessive compulsive disorder and obsessive compulsive anxiety disorder is something where a person is in fact uh having these very uh difficult obsessive thoughts and they are 
all consuming and they and they get in the way of, of normal functioning. So sometimes it requires therapy. Uh, sometimes it could be uh, made worse by West West. So it really depends on the situation. But all of these are relevant. You know, all of these can can affect us. It can be a mental health issue. It can be West West. It can be our nefs. All of these bases have to be covered when we're talking about treatment. Beautiful. And I noticed as well that, mashallah, Sala, you have uh, several lessons in your module on hardships and pain, just targeting depression and anxiety, because I feel like that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And I think, you know, year by year, more and more people get diagnosed, a larger percentage of the population. Um, Sala, just uh, to sidetrack a little bit, um, I know you mentioned, you've mentioned in the past uh, that, you know, you're an empath, that this, a lot of what you learn, what you've taught uh, through your books and through Transformed Online has been through your own lived experiences and hoping to kind of protect people from that pain. Um, is there any part of this course that's been really difficult to teach or any part of this course that, uh, you know, when it comes up again and again, it's, it's something that was hard for you to kind of address or to formulate for, for, for people? Or is this something that you've kind of gotten used to or you've become kind of accustomed to? Well, I think for honestly, for a very long time, one of the hardest questions for me um, on a personal level uh, to answer and then to teach was I under I had some sort of I, I came to some sort of understanding about unhealthy attachments, uh, you know, sort of through experience, et cetera, definitely through experience. Um, and and but then I had a lot of trouble sort of defining uh, in a in a theoretical perspective, and then in a practical perspective, what's a healthy relationship supposed to look like? What's a healthy attachment supposed to look like? And I think I, I struggled with that for a long time, where, um, you know, I understood um, sort of the one extreme where you're like, okay, this is an unhealthy attachment. But then how to love in a healthy way and how to have like a healthy uh, attachment to the things that we love uh, like our families, especially to people, because I think a lot of individuals struggle most with their unhealthy attachments to people. And by the way, a lot of these struggles you'll find when you study psychology, a lot of these struggles, uh, they're rooted in childhood issues, childhood trauma, sometimes um, through not having a secure attachment to a caregiver. So so there's a lot of psychology mixed in there too, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. Allah created our minds and Allah created our hearts and our souls and we're all connected. So the psychology of it is important too. But I think one of the hardest things for me was after realizing, okay, what unhealthy attachments kind of look like, how do you then explain and teach and live healthy attachments? And and I think that was probably one of the harder things um, to to understand. And I, and I, I had to talk... Like, and I, I remember asking some, some shiuch about this question. I it didn't really feel like I got an answer that was like, that, that, I, that, that I could really say was like, okay, this answered my question, you know? Um, so I think that was something I had to really work through. Okay, subhanAllah, Jazak looking for that thorough answer. Uh, a, a side point as well, um, is there any part of this course that you found to be the most, that you get the best feedback about that people keep coming back to you and keep mentioning that specific analogy or that specific story that you mentioned or that specific point that changed their life? Yeah, I think it was. It, it would probably be the process of every, of the, of every student um, sort of figuring out their own unhealthy attachments. I think I think a lot, so many people are walking around and like I, like, I, like I mentioned before, contributing to their own suffering and not understanding why. And I think that the, that the, um, the modules about attachments and about what is an unhealthy attachment, what does it look like? And then going into their own lives and, and practically sort of um, deconstructing their own pain and understanding wh what are my unhealthy attachments. And I think that becomes a light bulb moment for a lot of people. Uh, and a lot of people have told me that, you know, they took the class and, and it, alhamdulillah, it really changed their life because um, it, it, it made them diagnose why they were suffering. And, 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 and that's half of the cure, isn't it, right? Diagnosis is half of the cure. So I think um, people going in to their own lives and seeing how this applies in their own life and then taking that, you know, forward um, and taking action on that really is what what I think was a really major game changer for people. 
Awesome sauce. Jazeka Lachair. Um, I know we have very limited time left. Um, I do want to remind everyone the course that we're talking about is Transformed <laughs> Online with Usada Yasmin Mujahid. That is closing tonight uh, at midnight. Uh, so please make sure that you do, if you are interested, take advantage of the opportunity to register now at amalgrib.online. The link is on the screen. And now we have these QR codes. I don't, I don't know if you realize this, Stella. We didn't have these last year, but we're fancy now, mashallah. So you can just fancy. take a picture. Yeah. We're, we made it to 2018. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, and and, and uh, you can register or you can find out more information through there as well. Um, Usada, well, fair enough. We lost about three years in COVID, so I, it's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're allowed. Give us that. Um, just a final bit of advice. Um, Usada, if you, have, if you were to speak to somebody who just goes up to you and they, without too much details, but they're going through a really, really tough time, they're experiencing a lot of pain and they don't know where to start and they don't know you know, they, 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 they feel like their relationship with the law is not strong enough for them to, uh, to, to kind of start, you know, by asking him, what is the first thing that you would, excuse me, my voice is going, what is the first thing that you would tell them to do? Well, the first thing I would tell them to do um, on a practical level is to get up at night before Fajr at Tehajid time and literally no, um, it doesn't need to be in any specific language, um, no formality, just turn to Allah and just talk to Allah, just cry to Allah if you want, share whatever you want, just literally just ask Allah at that time. That is one of the most healing things that anybody can do, no matter what, is the tahajjud time we're told in a sahih, um, in a hadith Qudsi that at the in the last third of the night, so the time just before Fajr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down to the nearest heaven and he calls out looking for people who are calling out to him. And he says, you know, who is calling out to me so I can I can respond to their call? Who is seeking forgiveness so I can forgive them? Who is asking for something so I can give it to them? So Allah comes and is looking for people at that time who are calling to him. So this is the most powerful thing that we can do uh, in terms of our own healing uh, and, and, and strength. And what that will do, not only is it healing, but it's very strengthening. So if, you know, if you're going through something difficult in your life, um, this is the training. This is the time when you, when you're, when you're getting the fuel and the strength to be able to do what you need to do during the day. And Subhanallah, if you look at the Sirah, you look at the Quran. This is exactly what Allah did for the Prophet Sallallahu At the very, very beginning of his mission, he had a heavy mission. You know, like, like you got a big job to do, right? So what did Allah say to him? He told the Prophet Sallallahu to stand and pray at night. So that standing and praying at night was what was going to give him the ability to handle the day, to handle what he had to do in the day. And uh, and Allah says this in the, in, in the ayat. These are one of the first ayats, Surah Al-Muzammil and Surah Al-Muddathir. Some of the very first revelation given to the Prophet Sallallahu are telling the Prophet to stand and pray at night because that was what was going to give him the ability. We're going to send down on you a heavy word. Like he's going to have something heavy. Um, and, 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 that you have a lot to do in the day. You have, you have so much. So when, when things are really heavy in the day, you know, when, when you have a lot, uh, that the, the, the prescription that, that, the, that God gave to, to the Prophet Sallallahu was pray at night. And that was for, the Prophet So this is the same prescription for us. Um, if you're going through a difficult time, if you're having, you know, a lot to carry during the day, pray at night. SubhanAllah, Jazakallah khair, Ustada. Yeah, that yeah, was thanks. beautiful, beautiful reminder. To Absa, I want to say one other thing. I want to say one other thing. Um, Go ahead. Is that, and this is, so um, I use this analogy as sort of the foundational analogy um, in, in my recent book, um, Healing the Emptiness. And that is that if you're in pain, um, that pain, I liken it to a smoke alarm. So imagine that you're asleep, right? And you get woken up by this loud alarm system, right? That smoke alarm is telling you one specific thing, which is there's a fire in your house, right? So similarly, if you're going through a lot of pain, that is the alarm system. That's an alarm waking you up out of your slumber. Okay. But what is that pain telling you? That pain is telling you there's a fire somewhere in your life. 
And so just like if you are woken up from your sleep to hear a fire alarm, a smoke alarm, the first thing you have to do is figure out where the fire is. Um, so looking in your life for what is the source of the fire, because a lot of us spend so much effort, so much time just trying to quiet the alarm, right? Just trying to numb the pain. So you might hear that alarm and you're like, you know what, I want to go back to sleep. So you just take out the batteries but your house is still burning down. So what I would say to someone who is who is experiencing a lot of pain, you know, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as I said first, and then figure out where the fire is. Where is the fire in your life? And don't just take out the batteries. Don't just numb it, but look for the source of the fire. Because if you're just trying to hide from it, it's not going to change the fact that, you're, that, that your house is burning down. SubhanAllah. You know, I've heard that analogy from a medical professional recently as well. Um, I can't say it as beautifully as you've summarized and as they did, but, you know, pain is a good thing because something is wrong and then it needs to be fixed. If it continues, it can, there can be much bigger consequences down the line. You know what absolutely, I mean? So absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what we'll tell you. I mean, a person who's, who has a problem in their heart, like a heart patient, that the, the warning sign that you have, uh, you know, for example, you have some, um, some problem in your arteries, right? You have you have blockage. Uh, is that you're gonna feel chest pain? So the chest yeah. pain is the alarm system. You know, you can pop pills and be like, I'm gonna numb it, but you still have the problem. You haven't actually addressed the problem. So the pain itself is an alarm system. The pain is a is in fact a protection. It's an alarm. It's alarm because your smoke alarm is for your mm. own protection. It's not there to drive you crazy. You know, it's annoying, but it's annoying in order to protect you. So it's the same yes. thing about it's the same thing with pain <laughs> beautifully said subhanallah um we'll close off in in just a bit now i hear i just want to give a final reminder and i just want to uh, have you finally speak one one more time Musala Yasmin. i know this is the last opportunity we get to do this only once a year basically uh about transformed and about the impact that it's already had what is uh, what do you like about this format that we teach the course in? Because uh, it's not something, it's not live. People don't have to attend at the same time. Every, you know, the entire class is not attending live uh, at the same time. It's all pre-recorded, professionally filmed, edited and stuff like that so that it's available to everybody. Why do you like this format for teaching students? And what do you find beneficial in terms of uh, the way that you're able to benefit people over time? So, you know, in the past, I, I taught, this was my first course that I taught for Ed Maghrib, you know, for several years. And in the past, it was very restricted because I could only be in a specific city with a specific audience, a specific number of students teaching this material. And so it kind of limited um, who I could reach and how many how many lives we could really affect. But once I was able to put it in this format, the thing I really like about it is that it doesn't limit to just one specific region. It's available globally. And the other thing that's really nice about it is that you get lifetime access to it. So I think a lot of people, um, you know, they they might like, okay, I, I heard this at one point in my life and maybe it didn't really apply to me, but maybe the next year they really needed it, you know, and, and they can go back to that material because it's lifetime access. They can also go at their own pace. And then I also like the access to the Q and A's because, you know, when you have that opportunity to interact with the material, but then you also, I do these live Q and A's so you can come to these and you can ask your questions and other people's questions are also very beneficial, as, as you mentioned, um, to listen to that and, and, and hear how you practically apply these concepts so that they're not just theoretical, but they're, they're lived concepts. And, um, and I think also having access to, to, to previous Q&As, I think, is also be very beneficial. Uh, so all of that put together, I think it really becomes, um, it gives you this lifetime access at your own pace, and it doesn't limit to just specific regions, but it's, it's it's much more um, you just you're just able to reach so many more lives and I that's what I really appreciate about it. I think it's an ideal learning environment, especially for people who are really busy nowadays, who are too many things on their plate. Is it's on demand, it's at your own pace. So you can choose if you want to binge the entire course in a week, you can do that. If you want to take your time, yeah. you can go through module by module. You can revisit it with that lifetime access. You can revisit it exactly, and I think it also you have that community of other students uh -huh. who are on the same journey. 
I think that's also really beneficial. Exactly. It encourages you to do the content when someone's talking about how module three really changed their life. You're like, dang, I got to get to module three so I can figure out how it changed their life. So Alhamdulillah, it's a really vibrant community. It's such a pleasure, Sada, to have you teaching this class again with us. Alhamdulillah, I cannot wait to interact with you and the student body, inshallah, in the course. Uh, Before we close off, I'm going to just share a little bit more for those who are really curious, who are asking questions, who are messaging us to hopefully answer some of the questions that you have going on. Uh, And then inshallah, we'll close off for today's uh, session. So finally, this is just your last call, your final reminder that Transformed Online with Usadi Yasmin is closing tonight at midnight. Uh, that is October 13th, Thursday, October 13th. Please make sure that you head over to almagrib.online. As soon as you register, you're going to get access to the entire course. So you don't have to wait. You don't have to, to kind of, you know, spend some time and see when the next module is going to be released. Inshallah, as soon as you sign up, you can have access to all four modules. you got dozens of lessons with Usada taking you through the entire process of your transformation. And all of that, you have lifetime access to, as we just mentioned, so that you can come back and revisit it no matter what's going on in your life. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we also have live Q&As that are scheduled with her so that you are able to come consume the content and then come in and and into a live uh, environment as well and benefit and ask your questions and have others ask theirs as well. And those themselves are also recorded and available for lifetime access. So don't hesitate, inshallah. The course is closing super soon. All this, the interactive visual modules, the live Q&A sessions, the private member portal, the extra resources that we discussed in, in yesterday's session, guest speakers and bonus sessions, all of that is going to be at your fingertips as soon as you register. So we hope to, inshallah, see you guys on the other side and benefit together as a community. And I just want to shout Alhamdulillah, we have so many people registered already from all parts of the globe. Wasada was just mentioning that, you know, you get to kind of unify the entire ummah under these and, and teach everybody all this beneficial knowledge at once. So we've got Australia, Singapore, India, Pakistan, Maldives, Somalia, every single corner of the globe that was saying salams in the chat. Alhamdulillah, you probably have somebody, a neighbor, a friend or somebody in your community or in your country that is registered and benefiting from the class as well. So inshallah, you can be part of that community, that environment. Jazakallah for being with us, Usada, once again and for spending some time today discussing how to break unhealthy patterns and take back control. And shall we look forward to navigate, navigating and discussing that topic more in the class. But for now, we'll see you on the other side. For now, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa